Agile FM Radio for the Agile Community. www.agile.fm. Today I'm here with two guests. I have Patricia Kong and Kurt Bittner, both from Scrum.org. Patricia, let's start with Patricia first. She's the product owner of Enterprise Solutions at Scrum.org. Uh, she's the co-creator of Nexus, and when I say co, that is with Ken Schwaber and others in the team. She is behind the evidence-based management, Scrum Studio, and Scrum Development Kit. She is fluent in four languages. Kurt Bittner is the VP of Enterprise Solutions at Scrum.org. His background includes Ivo Jakobsen, IBM Rational Forest Research, and he's the author of three books, also with now Scrum.org. Patricia and Kurt have written a book called The Nexus Framework for Scaling Scrum, continuously delivering an integrated product with multiple Scrum teams. That is the focus of today's uh, talk is Nexus. Uh, welcome to the podcast, both of you. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. You make yeah. us sound very exciting. I am excited because I, I do want to talk about um, Nexus today for two reasons. First, the book is out, right? Uh, the book was written by the two of you plus uh, Dave West, who is not on the uh, podcast, but I had him in the past. And uh, we also want to talk about the new Nexus guide, which just recently came out. So where do we start? Let's start with the Nexus guide. How is that? Let's do it. Yeah, the new version is out. I think it was like two and a half years or so uh, between the versions. Um, what's the update? What is what's new in the in, in the uh, in the new Nexus? Yeah, so I think two and a half years. Right, we're in 2018 now, right? So we actually launched Nexus in 2015, and um, everything we had there was really just how can we add minimally to the Scrum framework to scale, right? So Nexus is a framework for multiple teams working together to build one product. And it was really interesting because at that time, obviously scaling has been a buzz and we essentially said, you know what, if people really want to scale, let's look at delivery. Can people get product out the door done, right? And so I remember those conversations with Ken and really talking about the teams and um, I've been writing a lot about scaling and generally what is it what is that motivation for scaling? What does that really mean? And it's it's about getting more done in a, in a shorter time frame. And also just, you know, organizations have seen pockets of Scrum work successfully. So what works? So 2015, we came out with the framework there and um, that was the first release. So we had a lot to learn. And in this uh, new update, it was honestly just a lot about clarification. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, you know, kind of cleaning up a little bit of language, but clarification about the new role that was introduced, which is the Nexus integration team. Um, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Nexus integration team, but it's it's people that are um, that are on the different teams that are in a Nexus, mm -hmm. and they come together and they're there to serve. Um, the nexus and to say, hey, what do we have to do to improve? We have to be accountable for integration. What are the different things that we can do to, to help us as individual teams become successful as one unit as a nexus? Mm -hmm. So um, that role is completely described in the nexus guide. We just clarified a few different things that were really confusing. So for instance, on the nexus integration team, um, you have the product owner, Mm -hmm. And then you have a scrum master and then you have uh, different what we call Nexus integration team members from the different teams. The thing is, is we used to describe this as a scrum team. So that just caused a lot of confusion. And it was just really because of the composition of the roles. Right. And so that kind of thing had to change. And then the, the purpose and the intention of this role um, has been further delineated. So so that was one big thing. Right. Um, yeah. So if I could just interject, because I yeah. remember, I remember when it came out in 2015, and I was reading, I think it was the first page of the Nexus guide. Um, I remembered, oh, I, I recognized that I must have missed an hour of biology class because <laughs> I had, I had to Google exoskeleton, mm -hmm. right, um, and the definition of it and how that would relate. That word is missing now. Yes, because because a lot of people had to do what you had to do in order to understand it. So um, the notion that Nexus itself is an exoskeleton uh, was really to say, hey, 
how do we like an exoskeleton when you think about bugs and all these different things and you know how what what serves as a shell essentially to protect the individual scrum teams but also to make them stronger that was the intention behind exoskeleton in a guide that doesn't work as well in a visual and in a conversation it works well but mm -hmm. the real definition that we talk about with nexus is just that it is a, a connection between things right mm -hmm. it's, it's just linking people together in a network and, and the that's the big thing. The, mm -hmm. the Nexus integration team is there to help make sure that happens and to serve the adaptation of Nexus. Mm -hmm. uh, the two things I think we really stress was, uh, I don't know if Ken's going to listen to this, but we really na named it kind of poorly, but the Nexus integration team is named that not because they actually do integration, but because they're there to make sure that it's happening. So right. it's that focus of integrating everything together. Yeah. So I hear people when they talk about scaling, they make like a like a reference to like the Scrum of Scrums, like SOS and so forth, right? The integration team goes far beyond that. Do you mind like going a little bit deeper on that integration team? Because I think that's a key in, instrumental piece of that process, right? That we're getting something done with a team of like a diverse uh, skill set here on that integration team. Yeah, well, and to uh, carry on to something Patricia was saying that that Nexus integration team, so it doesn't, it's not responsible for doing the integration. And that's one one major area that people mistake is that they hear the name, they think, oh, you know, that's the team that does integration. Um, really, it's the responsibility of the teams, the Scrum teams, to integrate the product. Yeah. And what the Nexus integration team does, though, is that it helps those teams to provide focus to get that integration done. So that can involve a lot of different things. Sometimes it means helping them perhaps um, put together a continuous integration strategy and framework and tools. Mm -hmm. and sometimes it means essentially, you know, in a sense, calling BS on the team saying, you know, you're not really doing an integrated product. You, you know, we, we need to get better at this, but it's a we thing. So th that notion that most of the Nexus integration team members are actually members of the Scrum teams themselves. So the Nexus integration team is more virtual than physical. So it's unlike the other teams. It's not a separate team that's doing this integration work and sort of lording over all, everybody. But collectively, you can think of these, these people when they need to come together to help the Nexus to get things done, to, to produce integrated working product, um, in a sense, they, they shift into kind of a different mode. It might involve coaching, it might involve helping to clear obstacles and impediments, um, it, doing things that all the teams need and they agree collectively to work together to, to get something done. Um, so so I, I like to think of it as this mo mostly virtual thing, but it's, it's, but as, as team members, these, these team, these members of the scrum teams who are on the, Nexus integration team, what they what they're tasked with is being accountable for actually delivering on that working increment. So mm -hmm. unlike the Scrum of Scrums, which is pretty informal, you know, you just kind of get together and hey, what are you working on? Oh, you know, what are you working on? Yeah, it's more complex than that. But but the point is is that, that you know that's a very informal mechanism, and that that informal collaboration between teams doesn't go away. But when things aren't getting done, someone has to be accountable. Mm -hmm. And so having that specific role for the Nexus integration team or the NIT is, is really important. And that's one of the things that, that differentiates Nexus from simply a, an informal Scrum of Scrums approach. Right, mm -hmm. and that's going to vary depending on the number of teams you have. But I'm really happy that you start to talk about what they do because integration is one you know misconception, but the other one um, that I've talked about about is that it's not a management team and people face that and say, oh, they get excited because they think the Nexus integration team is now this management team. Um, and it's not. It's, it's, it's not. Yeah. That they're, that specifically what we've outlined is that they're members of the different teams. Optimally, they're members because that serves the bottom up intelligence, right? That's mm -hmm. what we as agilists talk about all the time. And so it's we are them and they are us. And there's no you know authority in that sense mm -hmm. um, that exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, for me personally, the, the Scrum of Scrum has always fell short because of exactly what you just said, Kerr, right? It's the, 
Um, it's a, it's an, um, you know, a gathering of scrum masters, whereas here we, we do have, and I, uh, I want to highlight that to, to everybody listening to this, maybe not familiar with this process, is there is an, a technical person on that integration dream, team, right? Optimally, yes. Optimally, right? So uh, architectural things uh, being not only discussed uh, or recommendations are being given, these people are taking it back to their teams. Is that correct? Right. Uh, right. Uh, that is because true. that collection of, um, if you just have a collection of Scrum Masters, it becomes inefficient there also, mm -hmm. right? You know, the Scrum Master, Scrum Master's got to go talk to somebody, to come back, and then they rejoin again. And that's just um, not always the most effective thing to do. Yeah. Well, there are several uh, processes out there without, I mean, we're talking about Nexus here, but for, for scaling, right? And uh, Nexus is really on, on the rise, right? So we see uh, more discussions about these things in the, uh, in the industry. But, um, you know, what makes Nexus in comparison to others so, so special, in your opinion? Well, I like to think of it as, in a sense, the absolute minimum in a sense, um, you know, the absolute minimum extensions that you need on top of Scrum to really enable this multi-team collaboration on a single product mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean that those are the only things that you could use. You could use other, lots of other practices, but when you really want to, in a sense, scale it to, to the absolute essentials that you need to have multiple teams working together, this is what we feel is the absolute minimum. And there's a nice thing about starting with an absolute minimum approach and then adding things as, you know, letting the teams decide what they need in addition. Um, so, so I think that's one of the, the differentiators. The, the second one is that it's, it, it maintains the, in a sense, the, the simplicity of Scrum um, in, in adding that. So it doesn't break Scrum. It doesn't cause anything um, to, to, about Scrum not to work. And so, you know, one of the, the sayings that I remember Patricia saying to me probably, you know, the first day we met was, was scaled Scrum is Scrum. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's and there, there's something nice about that because lots of people know Scrum. And so in order to scale, you don't have to learn much extra to use Nexus. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to plus one that. And I think if I'm going to reference something, Kurt, <laughs> it's, it's let's not scale agility using waterfall. Um, <laughs> I'll answer this also in another way, which is some of the benefits that we've encountered and I've experienced working with different clients using Nexus is they talk about two things, and these might be organizations that have tried to scale in different ways. And one is um, that they're actually just able to get started. So they know it's from, they can just get started. There's not a big something that has to happen before they start, you know, scaling and getting product out the door. So they just use Nexus. It's like Scrum. They can do it. Um, and it's pretty basic what they have to know. The second thing is that a lot of these um, stories, and there's a case study, a webinar that we talked about with Capital One, where this organization was... Um, these teams were able to get a release out three three weeks earlier than what they thought. And the fact is, is that they were able to do that. And then the biggest benefit for them, though, was that the teams were really happy. So these are still talking about, you know, we're able to get work done. And by the way, we're happy while we're doing it. We're not suffering. And a lot of the time when we think about these other frameworks or transformation things or um, methods, there's still this big the stories that I've heard on that side and you know there's positive things but it's a lot we have told you that you are going to scale and change and do it this way mm -hmm. and I think this is a much more organic way um, a lot of this is going to feel familiar to people who have been doing scrum and so there's just that that inclusion um, and with the rigorous focus I think that we have towards the nexus goal which mm -hmm. is saying hey everybody we're all in this together working toward one thing um, how can we get that done? And I think there's a lot of, you know, all the psychology around that, around team behaviors is, mm -hmm. is interesting. Yeah. Well, there's, um, I mean, there's the brilliance of this, um, of some of these concepts, right, is, for example, just uh, today I had a conversation about, you know, like, how do we scale a project, right? Um, it's like, why, why even scaling one project, right? Uh, like a project of one team. Uh, why do we scale a project of two teams, right? And it's like, well, 
I don't know if that's actually useful. And, and the Nexus guide uh, actually says three to nine teams, right? So it actually reminds people this is for larger programs, right? This is for the project of multi-team Scrum uh, working off on one product backlog. A lot, mm -hmm. of, a lot of these Scrum teams are there or Scrum projects are not even falling into this category. They, they could just use simple Scrum, right? Basic out of the box Scrum, read the Scrum guide, get certification, get your training under the belt and, um, and get going. But this is really for large programs, right? You just mentioned Capital One, large organizations with large programs. Right. There's also something that, something interesting that happens, you know, when you talk about a company who has an existing project or program, um, and let, let's pick a large program, you know, they might come and they might say, well, you know, we've got thousands of people working on this, this program, you know, how can something like Nexus possibly work for us? Mm -hmm. But there's loads of examples um, in the industry of people using agile approaches, and they come in and they find a really large program in trouble. And the this, this successful turnarounds of these things usually involve first scaling down before you scale up. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, large program doing using a waterfall approach or some more, I would even call it ad hoc, you know, it's not even that well organized. Um, but they've got tons of people doing all sorts of things in parallel, you know, not completing anything. And so the first thing is, you know, scaling back to actually getting something working and, and delivering something and then seeing where you need to scale from there. Mm -hmm. So the goal isn't, you know, the goal shouldn't be when, when people scale to say, you know, we've got 2,000 people working on this program. They all need to find a job in this new world. Right. Like, no, let's first simplify the problem, get it down to, to actually delivering working software and then scale up from there. And what you often find when you do that is that you don't need thousands of people to do that kind of work. Exactly. Uh, Often it's an order of magnitude less, mm -hmm. uh, and there's plenty of examples. Ken's talked about um, the FBI, the FBI um, project and other things where you know you had hundreds of people and it, it, you sort of net it down to a small team, and they're actually able to deliver much more effectively. So our goal with Nexus isn't to try to basically solve all the possible problems in program management but rather to focus on this team collaboration to deliver working software. Mm -hmm. So that means that we're not dealing with portfolio management, we're not dealing with HR, we're not dealing with all these other things, we're not dealing with tons of different roles. But a lot of times when you actually scale down first and then scale up, you find you don't need all that stuff anyway. The mm -hmm. portfolio management problem has already been solved for you because you've got a specific thing you need to deliver. Mm -hmm. Now we're not saying that those other problems aren't, aren't interesting, but but dealing with scaling to mix all those other things in often complicates it. So we, we like to start simple and then build up from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's been a pretty central message is that, you know, don't scale if you don't need to, in fact, descale. And I think I'm going to say, get out of the kitchen. Cause that's what everything you just said to me sounds like, get out of the kitchen, but it's true, right? We're not, I think what we thought when we were what, what we were thinking about when we were putting together this framework was really what what can we give a framework around because when you get into those other things that go beyond delivery um, and it's not that like Kurt said that it's not important but there are a lot of other things at play there right mm -hmm. politics being one of them and so it's really hard to say here is exactly what you should follow and do um, and and so those things are are what make up some large programs mm -hmm. uh, that being said though. When we talk about practices, certainly, you know, coming in and descaling and thinking about what we can actually do to get back on track mm -hmm. is very important. Um, and also being able to measure that. Mm -hmm. uh, think about measuring the right stuff and what's valuable um, right. because it's really important. Yeah. You guys mentioned earlier something about like to, to have this thing uh, very lightweight in terms of um, process like this, the shell here, right? There is something I've noticed. I don't know if you share this thing um, as well, but I've noticed in these large programs when these skilled approaches uh, come in that all of a sudden also the command and control behavior comes back in. I don't know what it is, but like, like the question is like who would manage this integration team, right? Or you know, how do we standardize things across the board? Um, and it usually happens when experienced uh, scrum teams that have worked previously as a single team now work in a program. I don't know, whenever scaling takes place, is that something you guys notice in, in, in the industry? Um, but obviously, how does, how does Nexus react to that? 
Right. Well, I mean, that that's it seems to happen a lot. And, you know, we specifically um, don't do that. And one of the reasons is that you know, Patricia mentioned earlier bottom up intelligence, but it's also team motivation is that when you start telling people what to do from outside the team, it disempowers them. And so all of the reasons that you've got benefits from Scrum, a lot of it comes from having an empowered, engaged team that's, you know, that's working with, you know, within the, the scope of, of Scrum values and mm -hmm. delivering working software. And all of a sudden you introduce this command and control and start telling people what they're going to do, even to the point where you start assigning product backlog items to different teams and dictating the architecture from the outside. All, all of these things really disempower people and it removes all that really positive motivational qualities that you got out of Scrum in the first place. And so right. I, I really love this this comment that one of our um, professional scrum trainers made. Um, we had a, a, a train the trainer session for our scaled professional scrum class, and it was last spring or summer. But you know, he referred to um, Nexus as basically scaling scrum without destroying its soul. Oh, and yes. <laughs> so, so that's that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep the essence of scrum, which is really about empowerment and team motivation, while you also scale it, as opposed to doing things that, that basically remove that those positive qualities. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think I would add, if there are people that, you know, want to or need to be in the conversation, the Nexus integration team might be a place for them to participate, right? And and and, and actively work with the Nexus. But absolutely, you know, a lot of the times even when we're teaching and they ask these questions, we say, what do you do in single team scrum? How is this different? Why is it working this way? Why are you actually to, trying to scale? And it is a lot of the, you know, the different behaviors of just maybe insecurity um, mm -hmm. and, you know, what transparency is out there. And this is what I was talking to uh, with Kurt earlier when we were joking around about what comes first, the chicken or the egg, and is that around the same thing for transparency and trust? But mm -hmm. uh, um, and at scale, that just gets magnified. And what um, Edwin Dando, who's the PST professional scrum trainer that Kurt was talking about, is really this is about how to scale scrum how to scale agile without crushing its soul right and so it goes back to well bottom-up intelligence it's the teams and you know you can notice when those things are going wrong and i was i was doing a talk about this also because what you get is a lot of these um what they're calling scrum zombies right mm -hmm. and i said what does a scrum zombie look like well it's you know a person who eventually checks out right if you're gonna if i'm just gonna build what you tell me to do and this is no longer in the spirit of agility. So mm -hmm. uh, those things are s such things that you can you can sense. Right. All right. Let's uh, let's move on to the other topic I wanted to um, discuss a little bit. That's the book. Obviously, the book you just uh, uh, released, the uh, Two of You plus uh, uh, Dave West, um, the Dexis framework for scaling Scrum, continuously delivering an integrated product with multiple Scrum teams. So uh, we're writing January 2018. The book just got out like uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, there's a lot of books around Scrum. Uh, I believe this is the only one really that goes after Nexus. There is a Nexus guide out there for everybody to download on scrum.org. There uh, there's a certification and test questions and everything. But there is only this book. And um, what makes this book different? What did you guys uh, cover in this book that is not part of the uh, Nexus guide. So thank you for bringing up the book. I'm starting to think when you list out all these names that we're really not terribly great at naming and titling things mm -hmm. <laughs> because it doesn't illustrate the, um, the essence of this book and the passion. So we have, um, we have a course. So we have a two day workshop and what we do is we walk people through the Nexus framework in a case study. And that makes it real. So, for instance, when you attend the, the class, you are feeling what it, you know, is like to do Nexus Sprint Planning, cross-team refinement. We have that all put together. And what we talk about is here's the Nexus framework, but you're going to experience all these practices. So what um, Kurt and I and Dave thought was a, a great idea was to go through and say, this, this is experienced in real life. What if we explain the Nexus framework also through another story, um, through a lens of a, um, a company that uh, Kirk can talk more to, but also what are all the additional practices we think that might help these teams? Mm -hmm. uh, so we talk about the different circumstances. So I think that it was actually a really fun book um, 
a fun book to write and something that's different out there that, that will be easy to digest with additional resources. Yeah. Uh, in, in doing the book, you know, the challenge was that we have a, we have a guide. Um, so really, you know, the, the first chapter is just introduction. The second chapter of the book is really kind of a, a, a repeat of the guide, more or less, um, written in a little bit less declarative terms so that, um, you know, it flows better in the, in the storyline. But, but then chapters three through eight are, as Patricia mentioned, a, essentially walking through a case study of a fictional company that we invented basically to illustrate how Nexus was applied. Um, so it's the, the chapters intersperse um, text that describes what the company is doing and then commentary about how Nexus can help them and what they're doing and things like that. So, so think of it as an extended case study book mm -hmm. that helps you look at, you know, through examples, see how Nexus would be applied. So what's, what's different about that are a couple things. Um, you know, I've read lots of, uh, lots of books, written a few myself, mm -hmm. and most books basically spend a lot of time talking about theory um, and not too much time talking about how it's applied. And this sort of dispenses with the theory, or we have one chapter of the theory, because, but the theory of Nexus is pretty simple. But then we spend the rest of the time really exploring different aspects of how that theory, how that theory gets applied under different circumstances. So, you know, we start off with a team that's start off as a single scrum team, mm -hmm. but then they need to move faster. They've gotten more money from venture capitalists. So <clears throat> they, they decide to add people and grow the team. So they grow up to three. Um, and then that causes some problems. And right. I remember one of the comments from the reviewers, um, you know, they were, actually being a little, uh, expressing a little frustration because they say, well, you know, the, the case study company, they're making all the mistakes everybody makes, you know? <laughs> yes. And I said, that's exactly the point. Yeah. Um, yeah, the challenges. Because, you know, it all sounds very easy when you, you talk about the theory, but what we do is actually have this team go through a lot of the typical mistakes that people make, and then they learn from it. We show in the book how you can actually make mistakes in, in a couple of sprints, and the world doesn't fall apart. You can use inspection and ad adaptation to improve, and you don't have to be perfect, which is the reality for most of us. We, you know, we learn by making mistakes, and so in the book we have the teams making a lot of the typical mistakes people make, and then we show how they recover from that and how they use Nexus to recover from that. And eventually the team you know, through acquisitions and partnerships, it becomes distributed, and and that introduces some new problems, exactly. and so on and so on. So I I think it was interesting to write because it um, really after a while you start thinking about what's what's really likely to happen next to this team, and and as as I read and listened listen to novelists talk about how. You know, the, the behavior of the characters really just starts emerging. And, mm. and and the same kind of thing was happening when we were writing the book is that, you know, it seemed like, well, you know, in the next chapter, we really, you know, they should be dealing with this kind of problem because right. that's typical for a team at that point and that point in their maturity. So um, I like that. I think it makes the book um, yeah. very accessible. And the other thing is the book is pretty thin. It's it's about 150 or so pages. So if, if we're asserting that Nexus is really simple, and easy to understand. It shouldn't be a 400-page book. Yeah. Right. So it's it's nice. You could yeah. probably read it's it in an evening and, and, and take away a lot of good things about it. It's actually why the Nexus Guide, for instance, is less pages than the Scrum Guide because it's yeah. it's, simple and it's even more complex so we can say things. What's interesting is that, 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 that the book... It starts from the story of you know one team and, and growing, but a lot of the challenges they face are also um, the same for you know if you start out and you have ten teams and that's what you have. Mm -hmm. um, which you think about so yeah. so it's relevant that way too. So I, I can just see the reader right now reading that uh, case study of fictional LLC and uh, in one of those later chapters like oh no now they're going distributed no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's like more complexity, you know, like it's, uh, I can see that. But what's interesting, though, is um, 
I saw a metric from Standish uh, Group a few, maybe a year ago or so. And there was, uh, it was actually shocking on these very large programs, the success rate. I, I don't want to put a number out. I, I don't have it right now in front of me, but it was very, very low in, in terms of the success rate of that program uh, compared to a small project. I think it was like a uh, eight times more successful or something, uh, small projects versus large. So there's so much room for improvement on these uh, large initiatives, and um, and hopefully Nexus can help a little bit with this. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it certainly can. I, I had some similar statistics from a client that I worked with um, a number of years ago when I was doing consulting, and they they analyzed more than 400 projects that they had done, and they found that um, basically teams that delivered on quarterly cycles or less succeeded about 80% of the time, and teams that delivered on 12 month cycles or greater failed about 80% of the time. So, you know, some of the, some of the th- scaling issues have to do with reducing batch sizes mm-hmm. and getting release cycles shorter. And, you know, there, there's, there's lots of interesting things that sort of get thrown into the mix too. We, in the book, we focus mostly on the teaming and collaboration issues because that's what Nexus is about. But, um, you know, there, there's, you know, lots of lots of techniques, and we, we talk about a lot of the complementary techniques. Although our, our intent is not to write a book on mm-hmm. continuous delivery, for example, it's, there are excellent books that have already been written on that. So um, we do have, uh, in a lot of cases, we point off to those other books and uh, footnotes and endnotes and things like that, so that uh, you know we're we're trying to pull in these other practices without without having to re-describe them. Right. Uh, and, and yeah. So. Well, awesome. I, I do want to invite all those hundreds of thousands of uh, Scrum Masters out there, possibly some of those listening to this, uh, you know, check out Nexus, go to scrum.org, check out the uh, the guide, the latest guide, uh, maybe pick up a book, uh, the Nexus Framework for Scaling Scrum, and, uh, and you know, just see the, um, the concepts in action and uh, maybe give it a shot, at least have the equipment in case you ever have to scale uh, your project. It's a good uh, alternative to things out there. Um, I want to thank you guys um, for for this one here, giving me a little bit of input on the motivation, the new terminology, and so forth, and uh, creating uh, an appetite in the industry to get more. So uh, thanks for that, Patricia and Kurt. Thank, thank you, Joe. Thank you. And uh, just for everybody who uh, wants to connect, probably the easiest one is just through scrum.org. And um, just uh, search there and uh, Twitter and you're both on Twitter, yes. And uh, just reach out to everyone and uh, and start the dialogue. And uh, good luck to you. And thanks again. Thank you for listening to Agile FM, the radio for the Agile community. I'm your host, Joe Krebs. If you're interested in more programming and additional podcasts, please go to www.agile.fm. Talk to you soon. Thank you.